Happy New Year. Happy holidays, everybody. Today, we're taking a look back at some of the most compelling conversations we've had this last year around the case against Brian Koberger. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. We're joined by retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Coffendaffer, and we're going to get into the question that everyone's been asking this week about the Koberger trial. And I wanted to wait a few days to really have this conversation because there's so much information out there. There's so many people weighing in uh, on this. And I want to let it all kind of simmer a little bit before we get into it. Uh, Jennifer, I want to talk about uh, the plea that, or the lack thereof, that was verbally made by the Koberger camp at his arraignment on Monday morning. As we all probably know by now who have been following this, given the opportunity to enter a plea, they did what's called standing silent. They stood silent. Now, did they literally stand there and not say a word? No, that's not exactly what happened. Uh, Ann Taylor, the attorney, stood up and said, Your Honor, we are standing silent. The judge didn't seem to be too surprised by this, and then the judge automatically enters the plea of not guilty. But Koberger didn't say a word, didn't say guilty, didn't say not guilty. What does that mean? It was his right, Tony, to do that under Idaho law. It's one of the few states that that accepts that. Um, I so from a legal standpoint, there's no legal ramification. Okay, the interest plea is not guilty, but but why did he do it? Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a couple of school of thoughts. One is that perhaps in the future they're going to uh, use his mental capacity. In some way, Idaho doesn't have, um, you know, uh, pleading insanity as a defense, but mm-hmm. it certainly can be used in the sentencing stage. Okay. So that's one possibility. Um, I think the more probable possibility, what people have seen, legal scholars will tell you, um, is that it's kind of a form of defiance. I'm not going to be forced to say not guilty. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think it would have with the mindset of somebody capable of committing these murders, mm-hmm. uh, very narcissistic. I think there would have been some pleasure taken in watching the judge say not guilty, not guilty mm-hmm. on five occasions. I think there would have been some pleasure in that. Would it be? But, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but. But it's his, it is his right to do that. I'm just talking about from sort of a mental yeah. uh, profiling type standpoint with all we know about the person who committed this crime. And the fact that it was said by Ann Taylor, uh, Judge, we're not going, we're going to stand silent on this. It, it, I don't know. It, to me, it feels like there's more of a strategy to this more than just the psychological screw you. I mean, I can totally see him enjoying that. But I wonder if there is something more behind that. Is there any way that this connects in some way, shape, or form uh, to the 60 days that they have to determine whether or not this is going to be a death penalty case? Can that somehow come back into play where, well, Your Honor, we we never verbally entered a plea uh, of guilty or not guilty. Could that then open a door easier in some way, shape, or form to some sort of deal or is that just all a uh, speculating nonsense? No, I, I think from the standpoint that uh, possibly they could be thinking about a deal, and mm-hmm. so they haven't stated a, uh, a uh, you know the not guilty, the words of not guilty. It doesn't matter though, mm-hmm. because as a practical matter, that what is what was entered as the plea, as they well knew. Sure, standing silent. So that just begs the question, then why do it? Yeah. If legally we're in the same place, why do it? And really, there, there's really no reason that is explicable in terms of helping him. But, uh, you know, some people have said maybe he's considering that and that's why he did that. Another layer to the onion of the, uh, the Koberger case Uh, Another interesting point I thought uh, that was made, uh, as far as I am aware, I've not seen anything proving this wrong yet. Maybe you have 
uh, you know, if you have your child on trial uh, and is having an active uh, hearing about uh, first degree murder that he is alleged to have been involved in, one would think you would make the trip across the country to be there for it. Uh, as far as I'm aware, parents, family were not in attendance uh, yesterday. Is that unusual? Does it say anything about where the parents are standing on something like this or his family? Well, certainly, and I think the Dateline special exposed this, Tony, yeah. is that the family, uh, at least according to their information, really wondered if he was involved in this. Mm -hmm. uh, they searched his car. They were certainly concerned about the gloves being used in the kitchen uh, to conceal his trash. Uh, I think they had huge uh, reservations and concern. Yeah. Um, yeah. My understanding is, and um, well, I won't say this until I can, I'll say this on the next show okay. after I uh, <laughs> obtain the paperwork. Um, but anyway, I, I was not expecting them to make the trip. I think at this point, um, this has really hit them hard. Sure. I think they are victims, and um, I don't think they're going to be at these proceedings. Yeah, I, uh, I I can't imagine what they're going through. I just talked about that uh, earlier today on another episode uh, of, I mean, I, you have to feel for these parents. These are not people who, you know, likely in any way, shape, or form raised their child to go be this person allegedly uh and and to have all of this happen on top of you the impact on that family uh losing jobs i'm sure losing friends and all the other social implications that come along with it i, I can't imagine being there over the holidays and that conversation coming up knowing your child has the car they're looking for and why is he in the living room or why is he in the kitchen going through his trash with plastic gloves on and going shopping with plastic gloves on? That has to be a difficult one to try and square up unless this is something Koberger has always done as a, a way of practice. Correct. I mean, there was definitely a shift, uh, at least according to some of the witnesses, apparently, you know, on campus about the whole glove wearing situation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's very insightful um, using plastic bags because plastic disintegrates uh, uh, or not disintegrates, but it, it hurts the DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, it causes moisture to build up and causes DNA to uh, have issues um, as opposed to paper. So it was interesting, I thought, when I saw that he was putting it in plastic bags. I mean, I think he's very knowledgeable he was a PhD student in criminology. Mm -hmm. While he had knowledge, uh, his common sense, I think, uh, may have been a bit lacking. Yeah, knowledge, but not necessarily the knowledge on how to effectively apply it. And and, and the interesting thing, he's, he's doing this with his normal everyday life things. It, it doesn't seem like from what we understand, he was necessarily sitting in his parents' kitchen hiding evidence of the murder or anything to do with it. It sounds more like he was just going through you know, Kit Kat wrappers or whatever he had uh, that he was trying to dispose of in a way that would not leave a, a trace of him having been at that scene or around it, almost trying to erase, it seems like, uh, that he was at his parents' house even. Well, I think his big concern was DNA. Okay. This was what tipped him, right? He's yeah. driving yeah. to his parents' house and he gets pulled over twice, I believe, in 10 minutes. Yeah. And, and who wouldn't, if they had truly committed these murders, not be paranoid thinking, oh, my gosh, yeah. I'm surrounded. They are coming for me. And he was absolutely right. And, and if he's already an anxious, uh, paranoid person, it seems to have put that uh, into high gear. A hundred percent. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Coffin-Daffer, thank you so much for your insight on that. We got more to our conversation tomorrow around this same time on the podcast. Press subscribe so you don't miss that. You want an ad-free experience of the show? Binge away anytime. Sign up through Apple Podcasts right now and get access to all of that. Even try it out for three days free. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us.